Well, good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you to Crossroads, invite you to take out your teaching outlines as we're continuing our message series, Going Through Prayer. And I'm glad that you're with us today, whether you're here with us or watching from home. And I hope that all of you are well-rested after staying up and watching the royal wedding yesterday. (laughs) I hope that you've caught up on your sleep. Now, I know there was quite a bit of uh, press coverage that was given to the royal wedding, and rightfully so with all of its beauty, its opulence, its extravagance, how neat and orderly it was. Of course, with everyone giving their well wishes, as they should, to the royal couple. When I was thinking about all of that, in contrast to my own life and, of course, all of our lives, if we're honest with ourselves, although we wish it were different, sometimes our life is the total opposite of all of the royal decadence that we saw all over the news. In fact, at times, our life could be categorized as being one drama after another as it pertains to people and problems. Can anybody relate? I just want to see. Okay. Does anybody ever have... Well, some people really have a lot of people drama, but... Does anybody have any drama in their life? By a show of hands. Sure you do. We have drama as it pertains to problems, and we have drama as it pertains to people. And that is a part of life. Now, the question is not if people drama is going to happen, but maybe when is people drama going to happen? Followed by the next question, how do I deal with it? Well, how do we usually deal with our people drama? Some of us blow up and we just go nuts because I got to tell you how I feel. and How I feel is how I feel. And and I'm going to let you know that. I don't care if I throw up all over the room, I'm going to do it. Some people are the opposite. They stuff it down deep. And then one day they explode. And some of us try to repress it and pretend like it doesn't exist. And some of us try to medicate it or pick up a habit to try to alleviate the pain. And on and on we go with all of the different methods we do to handle our problems, whether they be physical problems, mental problems, in this case, relational problems. But the truth of the matter is, is that God gives us not a winning strategy, but the best strategy for handling our people and problem drama, and that is prayer. In fact, we would make a huge oversight if we didn't discuss this piece of the prayer puzzle. Because if you've missed any of these messages, what we've been talking about is is how prayer has many different pieces that puts together, as we put those pieces together, it gives us a picture of how God wants and desires for us to communicate with Him. We've talked about the accuracy piece, how we want to be accurately hitting God in terms of our prayers. We talked about the authenticity piece, that in order to get God's ear, He first has to have our heart. We've got to be real with Him with our prayer life. We talked about the availability piece. We've got to be available to God if we're going to connect with Him. We've been making this march, looking at these different pieces, and today we talk about the adversary piece, because we're going to have adversaries in this life. We're going to have people that perhaps are just dead set on being against us. They're going to be uh, people who are annoying in your life. They're going to be difficult people in your life. Now, it would be easy if we could just have everybody that looked like us, smell like us, and talk like us, and We think we would get along with them great because they're perfect just like us. But if you ask somebody else, I guarantee you their opinion of that diagnosis would be a little different. See, you're going to have different and difficult people in your life. You're going to have adverse people, adverse circumstances. How do we process it all? We want to give ourselves to prayer. You know, the Psalms are in many ways not just songs as they were written as songs, They're really like medicine, spiritual medicine, spiritual prescriptions that God gives us for our heart. And I think there's lots of people drama that is represented in the Psalms and lots of prescriptions, if you will, for how we are to deal with it. One of them is found in Psalm 109, verses 2 to 4, David talking about his many ills with people. He says, for the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful have opened against me. They have spoken against me with a lying tongue. They have also surrounded me with words of hatred and fought against me without a cause. In return for my love, they are my accusers. This doesn't sound too good. 
lot of people at his heels. But listen to what he says. Could you finish this next part with me? But I give myself to prayer. I just feel more relaxed just saying that, to be honest with you. But I give myself to prayer. It is a reality that people are going to disappoint you. In fact, some of the closest people in your life, the people that you would think you'd have to count on, they could be consumed with themselves, they could be consumed with a habit, you, they might just, you just might not even be on their radar. They're going to disappoint you. But you've got to give yourself to prayer so you don't go down the toilet. There are going to be people who are going to hurt you. There are going to be people who double-cross you. There are going to be people who put you down and persecute you for your faith. And in the midst of it all, God wants you to give yourself to prayer. And I think there's two reasons for it. One is, let's just be honest, so we don't go nuts. People can drive you nuts. People want you to please them. They want you to... You, they want you to bless and genuflect at their agenda. And when you don't, you will be the villain of villains. So God, in His infinite wisdom, putting it on a very practical level, putting the cookies on the bottom shelf, and I need that because I'm a simple kind of guy, He wants us to understand that we need this so we don't lose it, so we don't go loco, so we don't go do bots, however you want to say it today, in your own language. So we don't go off the deep end. We need to understand that God has put prayer in place for peace. In fact, it says in Isaiah chapter 26, verse 2, those who set their minds on me, I give perfect peace. That's prayer. You pray and you're automatically, as Paul said in Colossians chapter 3, you're setting your mind on things above. That's, that's a prayer right there. As you set your mind on things above, God gives you peace. A peace that surpasses all human understanding. And we need that in boatloads in these days. Because we're dealing with difficult people. Now, I think there's also another superlative in God's infinite plan for giving ourselves to prayer. It helps us to have a godly reaction to our people drama. Instead of flying off the deep handle, instead of shutting everybody out, instead of continuing the madness, we could actually use the people drama, just like bad circumstances in our life, these adversarial times in our life, they could actually work to our benefit. In fact, God said, He promised actually in Romans, that He promises this, that He promises to work all things together for the good of those who love Him, who are called according to His purpose. That even when we are mistreated, just like Joseph in the Old Testament, dumped in a well, forgotten, sold into slavery, that God could still allow us to prosper in His time as we respond in a way that is congruent with His Word. And it's this, I give myself to prayer. You've heard me say this for years if you've been coming to the church. This is your first Sunday, you're going to hear me say it for years after this. One of the ways that you measure spiritual maturity is in relationships. Spiritual maturity shows up in how you treat people. And when it comes to people drama, prayer helps give you a level mind so you don't go off the deep end, and it helps you to respond in a way that reflects Jesus Christ. After all, isn't that the goal of you and I following Christ, that we would be like Christ? Now, I don't know about you if you're willing to admit it, but I still have a lot of rough edges to work out. I got one strike against me. I'm Italian, so I got a temper, and so do you. So as Italians, you know, you think you're always right. I think that's every culture. We're always right in our own eyes. Just ask us, and we'll tell you. We got to give ourselves to prayer. In fact, I submit to you, we could really stop right now and just end the message and go home and sing the last song, um, because we've already taken the offering. We've prayed. We could pray again and go home by just by living this out, but I give myself to prayer but let's add on to it. Because we're going to have, no doubt, a people drama by the time we go to bed tonight. And then comes Monday, like a tidal wave. And your people drama might walk into the office. Your people drama, you know, you might be living with your people drama. People drama is a part of life. We understand that. But we want to give ourselves to prayer. And we want to give ourselves to prayer in a specific manner. And so I invite you to turn with me to Luke chapter 18. 
We've been in Luke's Gospel a lot through this series, and we've been looking at verse by verse, precept upon precept, wisdom from God's Word concerning prayer, and here is yet another piece, the adversary piece. As we come to Luke chapter 18, Jesus is going to relay a story concerning a widow. As you study Luke's Gospel, as well as his other writing, the book of Acts, you begin to take notice that Luke has a particular interest in widows as well as unjust judges. Eight separate times throughout his gospel and the book of Acts, which if you're new to the Bible, Luke also wrote the book of Acts, which makes sense. If you're a skeptic today, it makes sense that Luke wrote it. And I'm going to tell you why. Luke is the most educated of the four gospel writers. He is a physician by trait. His vocabulary and his understanding of world and historical events is expansive. He is, without question, the perfect human at the time that God chose to give us the book of Acts. And he gives us an orderly account, and he also portrays something that is close to the heart of God. You know what that is? Widows. Now, there are different categories of widows. There are widows who have living children, who the church makes clear in the book of 1 and 2 Timothy that that's the responsibility of the family. Family's got to care for that widow. The church could come along and be a secondary support. But if there's living kids, those living kids got to take care of that mom or aunts or uncles. That's not to be anybody else's responsibility. That, the family's got to step up, whether it's a widow of a woman or it's a man. Fam everybody's got to step up, not just one. Everybody's got to step up and pitch in because it takes a family, it takes a village. Well, that, that's not just with children. That's also on the back end. And so, when a widow had family around her, well, the family was supposed to take care of it. But then there were those cases when there was a widow who had nobody. They didn't even have a niece or a nephew laying around, no children. They were all alone. And we come to Luke 18, and we meet another widow like that. It says this, Now he told them a parable on the need for them to, could you finish the rest of this verse with me? The need for them to go on Facebook. No, no, it doesn't say that. The need to watch reality TV. It doesn't say that. Hold on, let's start again. He, now he told them together a parable on the need for them to pray always and not give up. Wow, this Bible stuff is pretty good. You might be going, thank you, please, somebody help me out here. I'm trying to work up here. Please. Yeah, the 6 o'clock service don't act like this. I'm going to tell you that right now. That's how, that's how I parent. You know, you play one against, no, that's bad parenting. Don't do that. Don't do that. You know you do it too, but don't do that, okay? Now, he told this parable. As we've said before, the word parable means to cast a straight line. Interestingly enough, uh, one of the, the demonic names of the devil, diabolos, means to cross up, uh, a variation of it. So G Jesus would tell these parables to cast a straight line because life is messy and confusing and we need a straight line. And so he casts a straight line here and he says this, he told this that they would always be people who would be praying and never to give up. And we could grab onto that today. This is like the ink's wet here on the papyrus paper that we need to keep praying and we need not to give up because we're going to have drama. We're going to have struggles, and we're going to meet a widow that has a struggle. It says, there was a judge, so we're going to meet a couple of characters here. There was a judge. Now, this was not a religious judge who presided over Old Testament matters and religious tradition. This was a civil judge, and this civil judge, he ruled on essentially people not keeping religious tradition and Old Testament laws. And so this civil judge we find out about was in a certain town, and it, notice this, what the Bible tells us, what Jesus says. He didn't fear God. That's not good. Can you say that with me? That's not good, okay? That's not good. You don't want to live that way. Because that word fear means reverence. He did not have a reverence for God, which then brings into case and question the man's character. His character is immoral. His mindset is for himself. And how do we know all that? Well, as you study ancient literature, that phrase, do not fear God, as you study it in its totality, means somebody who was given to debauchery, somebody who did not regard anybody else, especially God, somebody who was totally self-consumed. Sounds a lot like you and I before we came to Christ. Nevertheless, he was a person who lived his life basically in spite of God. 
in, in absence of God's shadow. He did not have any consideration for God. And guess what happens when you don't have any consideration for God? It says he didn't want respect people. No reverence for God, you're not going to respect people. That's why we say again and again, spiritual maturity and relationships, they tie together. So he had no reverence for God, and as a result, he did not respect people. Now, what's interesting is, is that this is a play on words. The word respect here means to be put to shame. In other words, in the Greek language, what it's conveying is, is that he had no shame in disrespecting people. As you and I, we might feel shame. I would never say that. I would never do that because you wouldn't want to have shame be brought upon you. This guy didn't care about that. He would treat anybody any way he wanted. And he could get away with it. He's a judge in a civil court and he has a level of authority. And even though we would like to think that every judge is incapable of injustice, that's simply not true. Just go do a search on legal cases on judges who have taken bribes over the years. I just recently came across a case in Pennsylvania where there was this judge, he was the no-tolerance judge, and he would send kids to juvie without a blink of an eye. They would do something insignificant. Two years in detention. It was crazy. Found out that this guy was getting kickbacks from detention halls. He raked in over millions of dollars. You see that today when people go to court. Man, why, what, man if I get it, I didn't, I didn't go to criminal law. I didn't take these degrees. How come the judge rules this way? I don't get it. I'm presenting all this. Well, who knows? And we're not saying everybody's like that, but it's possible. And it's certainly possible when somebody doesn't have God on the throne of their heart that they could be given to this. And so could you and I if we didn't have Christ. We could be susceptible to bribes. We could be susceptible to kickbacks because of our depraved nature, our sinful nature. Nevertheless, this certain judge didn't respect God, didn't respect people. Now it says a widow, now circle widow, as we mentioned to review eight times in Luke's writings, in that town, it says kept coming to him. Now that word kept is loaded. It means that she was kind of like the squeaky wheel. She was looking to get the oil. She was looking to get attention. She kept coming to him, but it also shows us that this woman was in a, a state of destitution. She had nobody to care for her. She had nothing going for her. She was defrauded by somebody. It says this, she kept coming to him saying, give me justice against my what? My adversary. She had an adversary. Apparently somebody defrauded her, perhaps of land and property, perhaps of any type of inheritance that was left to her as a result of her husband passing. She now has been left in a state of destitution. And Jesus tells us that she kept coming. She kept being persistent. And he told us this story that we might not lose heart because in his infinite wisdom, he knows that throughout the ages, there is going to be people who have their own adversarial circumstances that are in their face and that they got to keep coming persistently to him. Because what we're going to see unfold in this parable is that as the Bible was originally constructed, there were no chapter breaks. There were no verse numbers. This attaches to chapter 17, where he was teaching on the second coming. And what he was saying is he knew that there would be a long interval period between his first and his second coming. He knew that. We're still waiting for his second coming. He knew that in that time period, throughout the decades, throughout the centuries, that there would be people who would go through problems and that they would possibly be pushed to the limit and they would want to lose heart and give up. Maybe you have felt that way in your life. You have had an adversarial person. You have had people drama by the boatloads go on in your life. You've been disappointed. You've been let down. You've had difficulties. You've had one circumstance after another. It doesn't have to just be people. Your adversary could be your health. Your adversary could be your lack of finances. Your adversary could be between your ears, your mind. Your adversary could be your problems. And of course, we have the great adversary, the devil. And so all of us have that in common. Nevertheless, we want to give ourselves to prayer. Jesus told this parable that if this woman could keep coming persistently to an unjust judge, how much more should we go to our just judge, God in heaven? How much more should we persevere and persist in prayer? Well, how do we do it? That sounds great. We're ready to say amen. We're ready to walk out here and charge hell with a water pistol. But how do we do it? Write this first principle down. Base my people prayers on God's character. You got to base it on God's character. Some of us, we're pessimistic. Some of us, we're just plain old negative. 
And we base our relationship with God on the bad relationships that we've had, on the people that have disappointed us. First of all, forgive them. Second of all, don't base your relationship with God on those things. Don't base your relationship with God on their character. Base it on His character. Base it on His justness. Base it on the fact that He's immovable. Base it on the fact that He's omniscient. Base it on the fact that He's omnipresent. Base it on the fact that He's loving. Base it on the fact that He's unconditional. Base it on His mercy. Base it on His grace. When you're praying about your people problems, don't base it on how you and, you and I think. Because how you and I think, let's be honest, we're corrupt at the heart. We're praying for, some, for somebody to get hit with a tree from lightning, perhaps. Or some of us are praying, some of you are laughing too hard. You've got to change your prayer life, okay? We're praying for bad things. We've got to give ourselves to prayer. Not to pride, it says, to prayer. And we want to be persistent before God. And we want to be realistic in understanding that there are going to be some people in this life who will never say sorry. There are some people, it's not even on their radar to say sorry. And then they die, they move on or whatever, and then you got to stay with that. No. you got to release that person so you can move on. Forgiveness is just as much about you as it is about the other person. And so you want to base your prayers on God's character. Now, there are many things to say about God's character. In fact, it would take me from now until he calls me home to speak of the wonders, and it's beyond my vocabulary and my capability to go into the depths of the depths of God's character. But I'll attempt it and I'll try. And I want to tell you about two important areas of God's character as it pertains to what this woman was going through and perhaps to your own adversarial problems. First, write this down. Focus on God's truthfulness. Truth is a big topic in the Bible. There are some really cool verses in the Bible about truth. We're told to buy the truth and to never sell it. That's in the context and in the understanding of investment. How many of you have any familiarity or have ever invested before? Okay, some of you have. Some of you even work with it. Well, you know when you have something that is of great importance, that has the potential to yield tremendous benefit financially, you're going to guard that, and you're going to be extremely wise by making that investment. And there are those certain types of investments that you don't sell off, that you know to hold on to them. Truth is one of them. Truth is something we're told to buy and to never sell. We're also told that God is a God of truth, that he desires truth in our inward parts, that truth needs to be a part of our character. But we must first realize that truth is the very essence of God's character. We're able to believe and trust every promise. I'm able to declare to you God's word today, not because it's just one of the books, because it is the book because he is the way, the life, and the truth. And nobody comes to the Father but through Jesus Christ. And it's upon this truth that we rest. It's upon this truth that we draw comfort from. It's upon this truth. Jesus said it very clearly. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Because there are so many lies that are spoken into our ears. There are so many lies that people want to believe that I want to believe. And they're all tricks and schemes of the enemy, of the true adversary, who roars along like a lion seeking who we may devour. But he loathes us to sleep with his lies. But we need his truth. And we need truth in our people problems. Although someone might be getting away with what might seem like bloody murder, we need to realize that there is a higher court one day which people will answer to. And they will feel the justice at some point. But we don't need to get caught up in taking vengeance into our own. Romans 12 says, do not repay evil for evil. It goes on to say, as much as it depends on you to live at peace with other people. A little bit later on in Romans 12, 21, it says, do not be overcome with evil but overcome evil with good. And part of that goodness is prayer, by focusing on God's truthfulness. In fact, when you're going through a people problem, say, God, I know there's a lot of lies going on. I know I'm struggling right now. Lord, help me to focus on your truthfulness. Help me to focus on the truth of your character. 
And then what will come to mind is Proverbs 12, 19. Let's say this verse together. Truth stands the test of time. Lies are soon exposed. And that's what we got to focus on in our people problems. That God will expose the lies at some point. He'll expose it because his, tr- his character is truthfulness in his time. Secondly, write this down. Focus on God's faithfulness. Can we say that together? Focus on God's faithfulness. You want to have a trust in God that He is faithful, that He will protect you from the evil that is around you. 2 Thessalonians 3.3 says this. Let's say it together. But the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen and guard you from the evil one. I heard this story back in the 1600s. I read about it actually about a battle that took place. It was a 30-year war in Europe. And while the war was being won in Sweden, the king had died. He'd been slain. And so a discussion arose, a heated one, over who was going to assume the throne. And so some said that let's get the king of Poland who was a cousin of the king of Sweden. And others said, well, let's form a republic. The chancellor stood up and said, no, we have the king's replacement, his six-year-old daughter, Christina. And people went nuts. What are you, crazy? we never even seen this kid before. We don't know who this kid is and how this kid is and so forth. And so they brought Christina up and people got a close look at her. And as they looked at her, they could see the king's nose in her face. They could see the king's eye structure. They could see that she resembled the king with her her ears. They could see that even in her countenance, she resembled the king. And they put her on the throne and they said, all hail King Christina, the new king of Sweden. Well, what happened there? The closer they got to the face of Christina, they saw the resemblance of her father. Now, on a much more infinite level, as you seek the face of the Lord in the Scriptures, you will come to see very clearly who your king is. And it will help you exponentially in your people problems. Because we don't base our confidence and our hope on our character or on the character of other people, but we base it on the character of Almighty God. That is how we persevere through our problems. Slipping over your notes, write this second principle down. Equally important, I might add, Be persistent by keeping a clean record with God. Be persistent by keeping a clean record with God. Now, there are a few things as we look at this Scripture that we could see very clearly, but we also need to do our homework and dig a little because I think there is some important information that we would miss if we just read over this. Returning here to our text in Luke, it says, for a while he was unwilling. That's our friend, the judge who has no respect for God, no respect for anybody. He could care less. So for a while, he was unwilling. So in other words, this woman coming into this civil court went on for a while. It said, but later he said to himself, even though I don't fear God. So he knows he doesn't fear God. Or respect people. He was brazen. Verse 5, yet because this widow keeps pestering me that's how he looked at this woman as a pest i will give her justice so that she doesn't wear me out that word that phrase in the greek language literally means to strike me in the face that she was so annoying to him that it literally bothered him by her persistent coming here it is again How much more should we be coming to God who is a just God, who is fully aware of our problems? See, as we study the Old Testament, this man is blind, obviously, to the Word of God. Exodus 22.22 tells us that widows should have both justice and mercy. The fact that this judge who sits on a civil bench does not execute justice for widows on the first try tells us all we need to know about his character and his record with God which is stained at best. Also, we find in Deuteronomy 24, 17, 
that widows were to be treated fairly. This woman has not gotten a fair shake. She's been victimized. She's been defrauded. But it also tells us the fact that she kept coming. The judge could have easily found something in her record to get rid of her because he didn't want her in the first place. So what we can rightfully, I believe, interpret and assume is that this woman, as she was coming to the judge, she herself had a very clean record with her own character. Or else the judge would have threw her out a long time ago because he would have been looking for a technicality to hang on her to get rid of her. Like they tried to do with Daniel. But the only thing they could hang on Daniel was what? That he prayed. And perhaps the only thing that could be hung on her record that she maybe was a God-fearing woman, perhaps. Nevertheless, her record was clean. And that says of you and I that when we come to God, if we're playing about our people problems or any problem for that matter, we need to have a clean record with God. We want Him to hear us. We want Him to bless. We want Him to open the floodgates of heaven. We're not looking to, be, we're not looking to come to God's Word or come to church to be entertained. We want to be edified. We want to be sharpened. We want to be able to face our troubles in this present day knowing that He who is in us is greater no matter what than He who is in this world. And it's so very important that we take to heart having a clean record before God. And so write this down. Have a clean heart. Have a clean heart with God. In fact, in Psalm 39, it says that we should ask God to search, and to know our heart. That's a healthy prayer to pray. Ask God to search your heart. Because there's a little bit of schemer in all of us, isn't there? There's a little bit of untruthfulness in all of us to some degree. And we want God to hear our prayers. You know, a very, un- a very dishonest practice that goes around is called dining and dashing. And because of the internet, it's very prevalent today, where men put themselves out there on the internet, and they land a date, they go on a date, they order a very expensive meal. Some of you stop taking notes, by the way. This is not good. Some of you never take notes, you men. Now you're taking notes on this. Put your pen down, okay? They go out, they order a great meal, they pretend they get a call, they got to go to the bathroom, and they skip out on their date and the bill. And they recently caught somebody uh, with this, you know, again, with cameras and stuff like that. They were able to put this guy together. And you look at the fact that, I mean, people will go to no end to scheme. I also heard of a family, a very large family in Spain, who went to an opulent restaurant. They had appetizers, and and they, they ordered over 30 bottles of the most expensive wine on the list, Uh, obviously the entrees. And then as the dessert was getting served, they formed the Congo line and Congoed right out the restaurant and skipped out on the bill. And apparently, this took place in Spain, they did that someplace else 10 miles down. They leave a deposit, and then they skip out on the rest of the bill for a nice family gathering. And in fact, they booked it as a baptism of all things, celebrating a baptism. Now, I share that with you tongue-in-cheek because there are areas of our own heart that we want to dance out on God as well. And that little bit of scheming, that little bit of Jacob, as the Bible talks about Jacob, that little bit of Jacob, he's the God of Jacob, we're told in the Old Testament. So he's the God of the schemer. He's the God of the manipulator, because he can redeem us. That's why. Because he's he's a redeeming God. We need to give our hearts over to God and make sure we have a clean record. So Psalm 66, 18 says it this way. Together, if I regard wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear. So we want to give it over to God in confession. Next, have contributing hands. Write that down. Have contributing hands. So we can make the, I believe, the conservative interpretation that this woman had a clean record or she would have been booted out of the court. So we want to have a clean heart with God. But we could also make another reasonable interpretation here. Where is anybody in this woman's circle of friends to stand with her? She's all alone. She's a widow. She has no kids. Where are her friends? I'm sure she has friends. Nobody's standing with her. And this brings into question for you and I 
there are going to be people in our life who have similar adversarial circumstances, and you know what they need? They don't need you to preach a sermon at them. They need you to be there for them. They need you to stand back to back, shoulder to shoulder with them. They need you to take them a meal. They need you to give them a ride. They need you to pray with them. They need you to help them. That is living out the gospel of Jesus Christ. We live in a day and age where everybody wants a hashtag and take a picture of everything they do. We need to be reminded. The left hand doesn't even know what the right hand is doing, neither does the internet. We need to be focused on serving and letting God get all the glory. There's so much work to be done. But God isn't calling you and I to be a superhero Christian and save the whole world. He wants you just to look at your own congregation, in your own home. There are people under your own roof, with your own family name, with your own nose, with your own ears. There are people, your friends, your, your circle of influence, who God's given you. God's given some of you incredible gifts and abilities. He's given all of us gifts and abilities for that matter. Use them by having diligent contributing hands to reach out to the least of these. Galatians 6, 9 says, And do not let us grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. And there are some of you who have said, I want to give the rest of my life to serving God, and I applaud you. That's encouraging, by the way. That you say, I want to just, I, you know what? I, I've been down a few roads. I played the games. I'm done with low living. I want to live the high calling of Christ. That's what it's all about. And we're saying, we're saying, we're saying God, my hands are your hands. God, these hands used to be used for me but now I want to use these hands for you. And you will never regret living that way. That is the desire of God's heart, and it should be the desire of our heart that we would live in such a way. And so write this closing principle down. Believe and commit to God's timing. We mentioned earlier that the context of this particular parable is the backdrop of the second coming of Christ. My friends, as surely as the first coming, happen you can take it to the bank the second coming is going to happen and so the second coming is portrayed in the bible the word last things or last times is eschatos in the greek language and it means things that are to unfold now i understand there are a lot of people who like to fix a date onto those things anybody that fixes a date you know automatically uh, they're cuckoo for cocoa puffs okay so watch out for those people okay we're not to know the time and the day and the hour and the minute and the weather and everything else, okay? What we are to focus on, what we are to focus on is keeping one hand to the plow and one hand raised to Christ. That needs to be it right there. There's enough sinner in me and enough sinner in you that we'll easily, we, we want to go back to our silliness. By God's grace, he keeps us forward. And by God's grace, he could keep us committed. So you want to commit to God's timing. You want to commit to God's timing overall with God's plan. When is the second coming going to happen? Now, as I study the scriptures and I look at it, I'm not convinced. People go, oh, look at the world. It's going to happen tomorrow. I truly believe there's a lot more work to be done. And there, ne there needs to be a great revival, not just in our own heart, but in the world. How do we know that? Well, you look at other scriptures, one in particular that sticks out. God is not willing for any to perish. He's patient. He's patient in the return of the Son, Peter tells us. So we don't need to get caught up on timing. What we need to get caught up on is living for Christ. Because if he does come back in our lifetime, let him not find you and I at a church. Let him not find you and I living for ourselves. Let him not find you and I with our hands caught up in evil. Let them find our hands busy praising Him and serving Him. Let them find you and I committed. We don't need to know all the details. We just need to be reminded of the cross and the empty tomb. And the fact that He said He's going to come back, He is going to come back. And we're just, we're just good with that. We don't need to have books and seminars on how this and that and dates and verses and codes and everything like that. We don't need a code. We got a Christ. That's what we got to keep our eyes on. That's where the focus needs to be. So that's true on a large scale. But let's bring it down to your heart. Because he did say not to lose heart, not to give up, right? That's what it said at the top. 
So bring it down, because I believe it's meant for that as well. We look at the big backdrop, the big picture, but the big picture helps us to see the little picture in front of us. So then it says, then the Lord said, listen to what the unjust says. Will not God grant justice to his elect, those who've chosen, who cry out to him day and night? Will he delay helping them? Now again, God's time and our time is different. We have to keep that in mind. Again, a delay is not a denial in God's infinite wisdom. Verse 8, I tell you that he will swiftly grant justice in his time, by the way. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, because he's coming again, will he find faith on the earth? And put that in your life. Will he find faith in your home? Will he find faith in Jesus Christ in your heart? Will he find faith that the cross is enough and that there's an empty tomb in Jerusalem? Will he find that in your life? Oh, in this life, you will have trouble. But take heart, Jesus said. I have overcome the world. And we want to believe that way. We want to be committed to His timing. As I close, I would be remiss if I didn't honor one of our sweet members who went home to be with the Lord earlier this week. Kirsten Larson, I knew Kirsten, some of you as well who are in the church know her long, knew her a long time. I know Kirsten since I was 16 years old. And she went home to be with the Lord. She, 22 years, she, she battled a pulmonary hypertension disease. And so for the last 22 years of her life, she back and forth to doctors, and her health depleting, lots of other circumstances in her life. And at the age of 36, years young, God called her home. And she was a devout believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, a member of this church, and why I bring that up is I remember when we first got, when we first moved here, we were meeting upstairs, catching up and talking. And Kirsten, as humble as she always is, with tears in her eyes, said, because she had just turned 30, and she says, you know, I didn't plan my life after 30. I didn't think I would make it this far. And so she was extremely grateful that she made it to 30 years of age. And she says, I just want to live for God, you know. And there's a lot of things I'm not going to be able to experience like other friends, perhaps. And I'm not going to be able to do and have, but I'm going to enjoy whatever time God gives me. And I was just blown away by that perspective. Because what was that perspective? That was a perspective beyond her circumstances. Beyond the adversary of what for her was her health. And because of her challenges, she also had people drama in her life that she would tell you about. But there was some also other awesome things about Kirsten. She could eat, as some of you know. Okay, <laughs> This little thing, she could eat. And she would, she, some of you know, she would post pictures of it. But she shared that she loved the company. And she loved the fellowship of going out to eat. And I had the privilege of eating with her, and she could out-eat me. So that was pretty impressive <laughs> as well. But as I think about Kirsten as we prepare for what will be her homecoming service here at the church, we don't know the details and the dates yet. We're working with the family as she went home to be with the Lord as she was at a hospital in Boston. Um, when the family resettles back here, we will uh, be sure to let the church family know, and we'd love to have you come out and support the family, especially if you knew Kirsten. But I'm reminded of a verse that I often share, which I will share at her homecoming service. And I share it with you today in reflection of our adversarial problems and how Jesus told us to look beyond our circumstances. Romans 8.18 says it this way. And let's say it together, a matter of fact. For consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. That's heaven, folks. We're going to have suffering in this life we're going to have people drama. We're going to have problems. We're going to have setups and setbacks. We're going to be disappointed. 
deluded, defrauded. We're going to be in discouraging circumstances one after another. And even one day, unless Christ's return does happen in our lifetime, we too will experience death as one of the one people die. But we have a hope beyond this world. We have a hope in Christ. And I declare to you today, we grieve, we miss Kirsten. We'll miss her at gift wrapping, by the way. This girl did not miss a shift at gift wrapping, by the way, okay? Miss a shift. Inclement weather, she's coming. Wrapping gifts tirelessly, double shifts. Pulmonary disease, double shifts. There she was. And when I think of all of that, I'm reminded of this verse that there will be suffering in this life. There will be trials, there will be tribulations. But we must remember that all of this is not even worth mentioning in the same sentence with that which awaits us in heaven which Kirsten is living in the reality of now. And so, let us pray and let us not lose heart. For our King is on the throne. For we have direct access to that throne through Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We don't need a prayer card. We don't need a statue. We don't need to get on a confession line. We don't need to tip the offering basket. Christ is sacrifice and atonement is enough so that God's people who are called by His name and according to His purposes can have direct access 24-7 to Jesus Christ, the author and the perfecter of our faith, my friends, and not even the devil and hell could touch that truth ever. All right, let's go home. Play ball now. As we close the service now, the musicians are going to begin to come forward, and we're going to close with a word of prayer. I want you to have this hope. If you've never put your faith in Christ, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. This prayer hope beyond the grave, listen, beyond people drama, beyond layoffs, beyond medical crisis, beyond problems. You know, a lot of people go, oh, Christianity, it's a crutch religion. No, we, we must realize that Christianity is more than a religion. It is a faith. It is, it is a powerful spiritual force that determines the destiny of people, rich or poor, young or old, religious or not. It's all of us need Christ. All of us need His grace, for we are saved by His grace. And we all need that. And so let's stand together as we close for a word of prayer. And then we'll be led in our closing song of dedication. And as always, if you have any needs that you need to bring to the altar while the musicians are playing, of course, you're welcome to step forward, to step out. And you maybe, maybe you don't want to go alone yet. Somebody take me up with you, please. But whatever you got to give over to the Lord, maybe it's people drama. Maybe it's your own adversarial issues. And maybe today for the first time you say, I want that. I need Christ in my life. I'm trying to figure it all out on my own, but here's the piece right in front of me. I got I to gotta put my faith in Jesus Christ alone. And maybe today's the day you do that. But let's pray together right now with our heads bowed and eyes closed. And then uh, we'll have this song sung and, and we'll close our service. Our Father, our God, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who died for our sins and rose from the dead. We thank you for the perfect peace that he gives as we set our minds on you. And we commit these prayers before you. Now, with all of our heads bowed and eyes closed, if you've never asked Christ into your heart, I want to invite you to pray this prayer right now, just between you and God. Just say, dear God, I know I'm a sinner. I repent of my ways. I believe in my heart that Jesus is your son. That he died for my sins and rose from the dead. I ask him to take all my drama, forgive me of my sins, be my Savior, and be my Lord. Grant me eternal life 
with all of our heads bowed and eyes closed, if you pray that prayer today, let us know. We'd love to talk with you more about the Lord and put a Bible in your hands. And for all of us today, let us have hope in Jesus Christ that he understands exactly what we are, where we are, and what we're going through. Let us give our hearts to him.